students, so it's a nice change. <laughs> um, a lot of you probably think that this is going to be a carefully crafted comedy, and uh, I've just decided that I can craft something on the basis of what we've just heard, is that I'm also going to talk about uh, a thing with a wiggly tail, um, and an experiment on that wiggly tail, and I'm also <coughs> going to talk to you about vodka, funnily enough. So it's amazing, I didn't know I was going to have that link, so thanks Pete for that. And the story I'm going to tell you about is, um, I mean, when you look at me, you probably think, oh, what a cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just able to get up and make things up and people laugh. If only I had that ability. It must be great being him. And it's true, it is. <laughs> it's good to be able to do that. But I wasn't always as confident as this, in fact, when I first left university and took on my first job, even though I was a lecturer, I was a bit uh, difficult at starting conversations, especially with uh, members of the opposite sex. And um, I confided in a friend who didn't seem to have this problem. And he said, well, the trouble is with you is that you put people on edge when you talk to them. They think you're really intellectual, and if they say something, then you'll be critical of them. What you need to do is make them feel at ease. You should try the royal rules. What are the royal rules? I said. He said, well, it's what the royal family are trained in. Because they have to meet lots of people and make them feel at ease. So, uh, rule number one is that the Queen will say to somebody that she's been introduced to, have you come far? And the person will probably say, oh, uh, just from Chelmsford. And they say, oh, Chelmsford. Philip and I were in Chelmsford just the other day. We think it's a lovely place. And the person thinks, wow, they like my place that I come from. That makes me feel really good. And then, as that dries up, the Queen moves to a second question, which is, what's your line of work? And uh, the person might come up with something bizarre, like, oh, I'm a cross-stitcher in a coats factory. And the Queen is trained to get, oh, uh, Philip and I were just discussing our old quilts the other day. It's a bit motty. <laughs> uh, could do with a new topping to it. I must send uh, Philip along with it to you, and perhaps you could do us a new um, top to it. Oh, we'd be honoured to do so. And the point about that is that the person feels that they've been in a conversation. But in actual fact, it's simply being the Queen making the person feel really good about themselves and as a consequence, uh, they feel good about the Queen too. So when people say, oh, uh, what did she say? Oh, she was so interested in where I came from and what I did. So I thought, wow, it's as easy as that. Right, I'll try it out. So I was in the bar and I had a couple of drinks and there was an attractive lady sat down and I went and sat beside her and went forward and said, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? And she gave me that look that attractive women have got and said, go on then if you think you're hard enough. <laughs> and I buckled up my courage and said, uh, have you come far? And she looked at me as if I was a bit of a cretin and said, uh, no. And I was lost. <laughs> so I panicked and said, uh, what's your line of work? And she replied, I'm a clinical researcher. And I thought, oh, a life belt. Yes, that must be interesting. What do you uh, clinically research? And uh, the answer I got back um, stunned me, and I think it would have stunned the Queen too. <laughs> because uh, what she said was that she was clinically researching in a laboratory investigation the effect of alcohol on male sexual arousal. Wow. <laughs> I wondered, well, what would the Queen have said to that? Would she have said, oh, Philip and I were discussing that day. On Wednesday night. Uh, he's bloody useless now. A couple of gins here. Can't get anything off him. Uh, I must send him across to you and maybe you can do something with him. But then I thought, maybe no, she wouldn't have said that. She said what I was going to say, which was, how would you uh, measure this uh, effect of alcohol on male sexual arousal? And she explained patiently, that uh, what they did was they got volunteers, men, to come to the laboratory and then they would give them a standard measure of alcohol, vodka and tonic, and uh, related to their height and weight. They then they gave them a standard sexual arousal stimulus through headphones of an erotic story. 
and there were three tapes of varying erotic arousal, and they had a measuring device which measured the male arousal response. Well, <laughs> my next question, you're probably ahead of me. I said, uh, do you have difficulty recruiting people for this study? So, as a matter of fact, we do. And to cut a long story short, next Friday I found myself <laughs> <laughs> seated in the sexual arousing measuring chair in the Alcohol and Drugs Rehabilitation Unit of West University. <laughs> With headphones on, alcohol taken, and device applied, measuring device applied, and uh, staring out the window, listening to the monotonic uh, information that was being fed to me. You know the sort. Beep! You're about to be subjected to a sexually arousing tape. There will be a measure taken at the beginning and at the end of the tape. That measure will the difference will decide your arousal and it will be decided whether you are on average from the three tapes non-aroused, medium aroused or high aroused. So I was getting ready to be one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and then something caught my attention out a window. It seemed like somebody was on a ladder waving so I kind of looked again. And to my horror, realised it was a team of window cleaners <laughs> heading their way towards my window that I was looking out of. And I was kind of looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up, thinking, what am I going to do? So I thought, time them quickly and then work out how much time we've got. So it was 30 seconds, suds on, 20 seconds, suds off. 20 seconds down a ladder, 10 seconds move the ladder along one. And there were four windows away. So I had time desperately to work out what it was. And I didn't hear any of these sexually <laughs> So, uh, and then just before I could say, oh well, we will have time, we won't have time, a voice cut in and said, that completes the experiment. You have had your measurements yes. for the three tapes, which I hadn't heard. And your score is zero, <coughs> zero, and zero. That completes your part of the experiment, and you can go to the, sorry, you can take off your headphones, uh, disengage the measuring device, and uh, return your dress to normal, and uh, go to the waiting room where uh, an administrator will deal with the, your travel expenses, etc. So I did it as instructed went to the room where the um, administrator was, and lo and behold, it was the person who had signed me up. And I think there was a hint of a smile. <laughs> and I was extremely embarrassed. And she said, uh, right, uh, Dr. Stevenson, uh, um, can I just ask you a question? Have you come far? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like that, is it? <laughs> so I thought, here's one for you then on the Royal Walls. We are not amused, I said. But quick as a flash, she replied, on the contrary, you were not aroused, we were very amused. <laughs> so what I would like to say to you is what I learned from this story is, and it's been with me ever since in my research, is that you must include the participant. You need to know that the participant did get the stimulus and that your measure is therefore a direct validity to it. And I carried that with me. And the other thing I learned is that uh, window cleaners work bloody fast. <laughs> <laughs>